both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Blessing your grace. God bless you. Thank you. You're welcome. So the word has spread around that I do this, I help young men with pornography, but it's more than that. But by way of background, how did this start? It just started in a sense by accident. I mean, young men just started entering my life. It was really the hand of God. There is no accidents. There are no accidents. But um, what I began to see was that the pornography was, was a big problem, a big problem. It was holding them back. And the more I started dealing with it, I saw that that the conventional ways of dealing with it, they don't really deal with the transformation of the human person. It's basically watch your triggers. It's, it's to help you function without it. But nobody really had um, victory over it. And so as I started dealing with these young men, I started thinking about it a lot. I, I read on it. That's when I discovered that a lot of what's out there, it's well-intentioned, but it's not very effective. And I started praying and thinking, and I realized this, the problem's not really pornography. The problem is masturbation, self-abuse. And, and it's, a, it's, it's a beguiling problem. It really is. And it's probably more of a problem in our generation than it was in the previous generations. And the reason for it is this, is that kids grow up with pornography and they grow up with pornography. That's one, that's one factor, it's everywhere. And um, another factor is, and this is what I'm discovering now and working on, is that there's no real male bonding and fellowship and communion anymore. It's very hard to find. And I think that's a serious lack in our culture as well. I will get to that later. But what happens is that because pornography is so ubiquitous, okay, the, the, the temptation to self-abuse in order to escape life's hardships, especially the emotional hardships that that all young men go through is very easy. And not having male role models, which is the same real communion with adult males anymore, the, the, the collapse of fatherhood in our culture is absolutely catastrophic. The young man is left on his own. And so what happens is instead of being able to go through the necessary steps that lead to stable adulthood, those steps are thwarted. And, and he enters adulthood half a man. You know, sometimes the coping behaviors that we ad adopt when we're, when we're young, they, they protect us from, from pain and harm the vicissitudes of life, they do. But when we carry them into adulthood, they become, they become <clears throat> crippling, absolutely crippling. And these guys were young, you know, 19, 20, 21 years old. That's how it started. And they were crippled by that habit because it becomes habituated. And when something becomes habituated and it's driven by something else, in internal dysfunction, it's almost impossible to break. It's almost impossible to break. So what I'm saying is that habituated self-abuse is a pathology, but it's a th pathology, I would say it's probably affects 90 to 100% of all men, especially young men, but all men are temp tempted by it because, because the, the the lure to escape in that way is just so easy. It's so easy that um, it's created, I think, a catastrophic social crisis and it affects our men in the church just as it does in 
our men in the larger culture. I wrote about this when I was first discovering it, and it's linked in the chat room. Um, <clears throat> I wrote an editorial in the Minneapolis Star and Tribune entitled, Pornography is an Affliction for Young Men and it has been mainstream. It comes from the depths of hell to destroy their characters before they can grow into a healthy sense of who they are. I had to secularize it a little bit, but the editor of the paper really liked it. He actually asked me to write it. And so I wrote it. And that was my first foray into kind of the public into sharing what I was learning. And um, what I found is that um, there, is a, there is a therapy for it. There is a therapy for it, but the therapy has to focus on the self-abuse, not the porn. Porn basically functions as once it's become habituated as a self-abuse accelerant. It's really what it is. And if you focus solely on the porn, there will be no victory. There will be no victory. You have to focus on the self-abuse. Focus on the self-abuse, the man finds power over the pornography. Now, I call this whole project sexual sobriety. And the reason I call it sexual sobriety is because everybody understands what that means. You know, sobriety is a big topic in the broader culture, mostly because we're just, just the addictions in our culture. Um, I mean, sky high. It's really, it's really a huge problem. And so sobriety is kind of a buzzword. And so I used it and I say sexual sobriety. But what I'm really talking about theologically is chastity. But nobody understands what chastity is. And rather than use a word and then have to give the definition, I use sexual sobriety because everybody keys in on that and, and understands it. Now, what what is chastity? Okay, um, I did some hunting around and I found a good workable definition. Okay, the orthodox experience of chastity is not one primarily of deprivation. It's a functional, it's a functional definition, but functional definitions we understand the best. But the bright sorrow of struggling to direct one's deepest desires to the their fulfillment in God with the help of his grace. Rather than an objectifying lack, authentic chastity expresses the beautiful fullness of a desire for authentic relationship in Christ. But even that functional definition is rather abstract. How does this work pastorally? As I was dealing with, um, with these men, I realized that the habitual self-abuse was really an attempt to experience the gratification of a maturing manhood. I began to see, and I think it was, I'll be honest with you, divine revelation. St. Maximus, a confessor, um, yes, I said, I gotta read him, I gotta look. And St. Maximus, the, the confessor, and I did. And St. Maximus, a confessor says that all desire, even inordinate desire, the sinful desires, is a desire for God. Now, this is a radical anthropology. It's radical, but it's orthodox anthropology because it sees the human person as geared towards the good. And what that does then, what it does, it forces you to think about the healing of the human person out of the moralistic categories that come from an exclusively rationalistic outlook on the world, a materialist, materialist outlook, ultimately. We have the commandments, thou shalt not, right? We have those commandments, but those commandments really in the orthodox understanding of the human person, those that commandments, even though they conceptually exist outside of us, actually reveal to us the innate structure of the soul. And that's very important because a big part of these young men's healing is when that commandment is, in a sense, internalized. Now, what do I mean by that? If the desire, and it's, it, 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 it's largely, and 
what I would say an involuntary desire in a way, the habituation. Um, it can't be defeated by willpower alone. If you try willpower, it lasts for about four days and then you collapse. And usually what happens is you're so exhausted by that, that, that exercise, and this is what happens to, to, to the young men, is you cycle down and you just get into to, to what I label and they understand as sexual anarchy. Right, and you fall into sexual anarchy, which means that 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 the the self abuse cycle actually increases on the, until they reach a point of spiritual exhaustion. And when I say it's involuntary, there's always an element of volition in that, but it's not simply a question of the will. It's not simply a question of I'm going to stop, and and then they stop. It is what I said, as I said, it's a pathology that requires a therapy. And so how do we do the therapy? How do we do the therapy? When a person begins to practice the ascetic life, all right, and says, you know, I'm out of control. I've got to bring myself into control. I've tried to heal myself, but it doesn't work, right? I need help. And they do, they do need help. And so when you outline what the behavior should be and you say to them, okay, we're gonna give this a, sh a shot, we're gonna try. What happens is a space opens up between the impulse and the act. When something is habituated, there's no space between the impulse and the act. You just go from one to the next. But when you practice abstinence, you say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna break this habit. I'm gonna fight against it. What happens The space opens up and it's in that space where God begins his work. However, a man cannot do this alone. So the young man needs a guide. He needs a spiritual father. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a priest. It has to be a man who, first of all, loves the young man and understands the dynamic and is and understands the struggle, understands the struggle. That's very important. Because the young man, in order to heal, has to experience that which he did not experience growing up. He has to catch up in a way. And a big part of that is that human connection with another male. This is what I was talking about earlier when I say we need brotherhood. A lot of the reason we have the problems is because a lot of these men don't have a connection with their fathers. But we become their father. We become their father. And so it's in communion with the guide the mentor, the spiritual father, that the young man begins to achieve victory. Now this space, and here's where a spiritual guide is very important. The space is where the healing happens. And what appears there is what was thwarted in his younger years. And you begin to deal with that. And it all, it, it, it could be many things you know, a lot of different circumstances, a lot of different dynamics. It could be, you know, problems in the home. It could be problems in the school, whatever it is. But they all crystallize around one common point. And the common point is he's not secure in his own masculinity. That's what it is. And when you think about it, when you, when you take off these, these moralistic blinders that we have in the dominant culture, right? Um, which is basically thou shalt not. If you remove all that and you just look at it in terms of, of, of creative dynamics of the human person, the energies within a human person, the energy of desire, and, and you, you begin to think about what self-abuse really is, you begin to see that what it is, it's a subversion, subversion of man's creative prowess his creative power. Now, this is what I discovered, 
this is what I discovered. And then I'm going to point you again to, to the, the chat box. And at the very bottom is a link to a touchstone lecture. I gave a, le a lecture on this to um, a touchstone conference on restoring patriarchy in the culture. And I really hit hard on that, on that, this creative dimension, this, this linking sexuality to man's native creative prowess. And I discovered that because in talking to these young men, it was always the weakness they would feel, the weakness they would feel after self-abuse, right? And what it really is and the effect it had on them was that it was a dissipation of their creative power. That's what it is. It's a dissipation of man's native creative power. And that's why it short circuits the growth into self-confident manhood. And when you think of the act itself, when you think of the act itself, what, what is it? A man stimulates his own genitals so that he can feel good, number one, but he also produces by it the regenerative seed, that which continues the human race. I'm looking at it outside of any moralistic category, right? So what's he really desiring here? He's desiring to become a strong man. He's just doing it in the wrong way. So what that showed me then is redirect that desire, redirect that desire. Now, when you redirect that desire, how do you redirect it? You direct it into work is what you do because man creates with his hands. Women create with their bodies. They give birth to new life. Men create the culture in which this new life is raised. So we build bridges, skyscrapers, we build businesses, you know, we, we build cars, we fix things, all the stuff that men do. They do it with, with their hands, they make things. So apply your hands to work, to creative work. And what happens is, and a lot of them just don't know what to do, but, but you as an adult, you're gonna see what their talents are and you're gonna direct them into that. If you see that they have, have no discipline, they have not learned how to work, then what they're gonna do for a while, they're just gonna do physical and manual labor. It's the quickest way to learn self-discipline how to master your body instead of your body mastering you. This is the way I talk to them, right? And, and they do it, they do it. And when they do it, and it's, it's, it's all the, the other stuff too you've been hearing, make your bed. I was, I, one guy called me up and I always end our conversations with a prayer and I'm saying the prayer and I'm seeing him sitting in his messy room. It was a disaster, I just saw it. And so in the middle of the prayer, sometimes I'll stop in the middle of prayer and we'll talk and we'll go back into the prayer. In the middle of prayer, I said, describe to me what your room is like right now. And he laughed. He says, oh, it's just a disaster. I said, you got to start there. You got to start there. You're living in a pig pen. You want an ordered life, but you're living in a pig pen. I said, clean that room up. It's your first assignment. Right? And he did. And, and because they're young, you have to teach them the simplest things like how to set a schedule, that kind of thing. Make your bed, that whole kind of, of ethos of self-development that's so popular among young men right now. They do that. But once they taste that sense of, of gratification that comes through creative activity, improving themselves, moving themselves forward, it can be the smallest thing what happens is the gratification they were seeking through the misapplication of their desire, it is satisfied through work and the commandment becomes at that point internalized, which is to say the noose awakens because they experience that this is actually part of their created nature. And, and success fosters success. So even in the small things like making your bed, you step onto the next and the next and the next. 
and they love that feeling of self-assurance of learning, beginning to learn who they are and having success in the world. That's how it works. And it's that awakening. This is what the self-help stuff and the group stuff and all that. And, you know, pornography is, is the problem stuff. Those kind of therapies don't understand. They don't get it. They don't see that the healing comes through an interior transformation, the redemption of the person. And a redemption of the person is always the restoration of his created nature. That's orthodoxy. Christ came to redeem the fallen Adam. And there's tremendous spiritual power in this. And what I've learned from this, that's very close to my heart, no one, no one, no one, no one, no one desires their healing more than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as a result, he's very powerful on their, on their behalf. But again, they need guidance. They need guidance because not having the loving father in their lives, at least not to the measure that they needed it, okay, um, they don't know that God loves them. They just don't know. It's taking, it's taking John's dictum and putting a different spin on it. It says, if you can't love your brother who you can see, how can you love God who you can't see? Well, you can say, well, not having anyone that they saw that they could trust, how can you trust God that they can't see? They can't. They can't. So you end up becoming the mediator to them of the Lord. But yet through this process of interior redemption, their faith grows too. Their faith grows too, because they know God is involved in that redemptive experience. So what do you do? What do you do then? Well, what I do is, you know, my whole catechesis has changed. It's really changed. My catechesis now is I used to do orthodoxy in 10 easy lessons, history one week, liturgy the next week, scripture the week after that, right? I don't do that anymore. Now it's how do we walk with God? How do we find God? How do we conform our lives to him? And as they experience these things in their own life, in overcoming these vices, then I feel the, the content with, with, I can, the experience, I give conceptual structure to this experience by teaching them the theology at that point. I teach it as I go along. Because before that, it's all abstract. They feel like they've, they've got to conform to the abstraction, but the part of the healing of the soul is left unaddressed. So now it's, it's about healing the soul. And that includes, you know, with the, this is, this is where orthodoxy becomes very practical. Instead of conforming, conforming themselves to, to, to a structure that they don't really understand, something abstract, that they try and inculcate in their lives. What happens is, is the simple things, we call it the fundamentals. We call it the fundamentals. And they would include fasting, prayer, confession. Okay, the Orthodox fundamentals. But they're worked into their life as this healing is going on and as we're working on this project. And so the fund fundamentals become inculcated, but there's also an immediate reward with them. That reward is what I said, the awakening of the noose, right? That breathing of, of real life and feeling, this is, this is what it's like for them, feeling, you know, the strength of manhood start to grow and they love it. So fasting makes sense. Confession makes sense. Prayer makes sense. Uh, they, they don't know how to pray. So I pray with them. I pray with them a lot. I say, well, we're going to pray. And, and they learn how to pray by listening to me pray. And I teach them how to do the Jesus prayer. And I teach them how to fight the temptation when it comes. And so what I'm outlining here then 
basically I think is a, a therapy for healing. Now, after the Touchstone Conference, what happened was that video went kind of semi-viral. It ended up on some alt-right boards. And I started getting calls from young men. And, and they just found my number and called me and we would talk. And I would ask them, I said, what was it about the talk that, that, that um, pulled you in? What, motive, what, what was it in the talk that motivated you to call me? And they said that creativity thing, I've never heard that before. Well, that's St. Maximus the Confessor, that creativity thing. He says, it's so true. It rings so true. And I feel it. I, that's, what I, that's why I feel so bad after I masturbate. It's, it is a disputation. I feel like less of a person, less of a guy. And I said, well, it's time to start dissipating your creative energy. The, the example I always use is Samson cutting his hair, you know, and I kind of stretch the analogy a little bit, but it works. I said, Samson's strength was in his hair, but then Delilah came and convinced him to cut his hair and he grew weak. I said, every time you masturbate, you're cutting your hair. They go, I know, Father, that's what it feels like. Yes, it does. Now, I have to tell you that, that okay, this, this, you, you know, this is a struggle that every man deals with I, throughout his whole life. I hear the confessions, all the priests hear the confessions. Okay, it does. It doesn't go away. But the mastery of it, the temptation doesn't go away. But, but you know, just like, like, the Lord allowed the devil to tempt Job, right? The Lord allows these temptations to come to us so we might grow stronger. This becomes, and they begin to see this, this becomes the path into authentic and stronger manhood. You know, a lot of them will have a victory for a long time, for a long time. And then the temptations come back and they might look at the porn they confess, thank God, they confess right away. And we start working on it and this and that. But I warn them, I say, you know, you're going to be battling this the rest of your life. But don't get discouraged because you know the fundamentals and apply the fundamentals. And if you do, you'll get stronger. The Lord allows the temptations. So he doesn't send them. He does not tempt us. But the whole, our whole life is a process of being redeemed that will, that will be completed in the final day. So sometimes when the temptation comes, take it, take it as a challenge to grow stronger because the Lord has more for you to do. But you can't do it unless you grow stronger. And this is the means of growing stronger. And I look at their lives and their lives really turn around and their lives really improve. Some, long, some take longer than others, but this is a therapy that works. Now, what I would like to do is I, 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 I wanna teach other people how to do this because I, I mean, my, I don't think I can take on any more guys. I, a lot of guys call me on the phone and I love working with them. It is probably, some of the most rewarding work I've ever done. There's no more joy. You know, again, I go to John. I'm not an apostle. I'm a priest, I, but I try and be a faithful priest. And John says, I have no greater joy than to see that my children walk in truth. When I see these guys come into their own, it's like the best thing ever. There's such joy in that. And, you know, they're learning how to stand on their own two feet. They're, 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 they're coming out of the enslavement to the vice. They're being healed. And it's just beautiful. But there's got to be other people. And there's got to, I, I don't quite know how I'm going to resolve this yet. I'm thinking maybe I should write a book. Okay. Now, <clears throat> rather than go into any more detail, I do want to show you a book. It's called Healing Humanity. And... It's put out by um, Holy Trinity Seminary Press. There was a conference I was invited to 
and the conference was titled Healing Humanity, Confronting Our Moral Crisis. The reality is, is that in orthodoxy, we don't really know yet, and we're figuring it out, how to bring the tradition forward in this area to be relevant in, in, in a modern context. Okay, so, I mean, we can, we can I'm, I'm talking about taking what, what we've been given, our heritage, our tradition, but, but, but working it out so it has practical and concrete pastoral application. This was one of the first efforts at doing that. And the conference was called, it was a very good conference, and it talks about this, the book is divided into two sections. The first is the theological, and the second is the practical. I have a chapter in this book that is called Pastor, Pastoring Young Men into Manhood, which explains in, 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 in greater detail and with, with some theological embellishment what I just outlined. So if you're interested, go ahead and buy this book because it, it, it's good. It will, it will, it will um, help you understand these things in deeper ways. And so, um, Michael, it's 741. I've got more, but, but maybe we should stop now and take questions. Yeah, I think that'd be good, Father. And we already have one question in the chat. So I'll go ahead and read that out loud. And if anyone has a question for Father Hans, feel free to type it up in the chat for him or unmute when there's a pause. Uh, Theodore is asking, a lawyer does work with his mind. How does that compare to manual labor? Manual labor is really necessary um, for a young guy to learn how to master his body, okay? Because most of these guys don't know how to master their body. They've, they've grown up in a virtual world, okay? They're, they're, a lot of their experience, their, their real experience has been painful. Their vicarious spirit, uh, experiences have been heroic, okay? But the body doesn't learn any, any discipline. The body is inert. Okay, the body does what we tell it to do. And so the manual labor teaches them, teaches them self-discipline. It's the beginning of learning how to master your body. Now, now, um, now the lawyer doesn't do that, but I would say that the lawyer still has to have some kind of physical activity in his life. You gotta do something. You have to do something with your body, right? Um, and if, let's say, hypothetically, I don't know what's behind the question, but let's say hypothetically, um, the lawyer is dealing with this problem, all right? I would suggest that he starts working out or something like that, or get a bike, or walk, or do something like that. These are fundamentals. These are fundamentals, and they apply no matter what we do, Right, and or and how old we are. Yeah, Father, somebody actually you answered somebody's question here. Mike Zelesnik was saying, "How does exercise fit into this?" And you just touched on that. Um, Brad Carter was asking, "Would you please include the link to the conference that you spoke at?" I'm not sure if that's one of the links you shared yeah, about. That's the link to the Touchstone lecture. It's the last link on the chat. Okay, so he, you can, uh, Brad, you can scroll up and click on that. And when we share this on our YouTube channel, we'll include the links to all three links will be in the video's description. Father Hans, I had a question, if I might, before we get to the other ones. Um, you know, I heard two key words that in your talk that really resonate with me and I think apply to our current situation coming out of this pandemic. You mentioned the need for brotherhood, and you've said that many times before. And I personally believe, you know, we always talk so much about the need for a spiritual father, but we really have need for spiritual brothers. Yeah. And, and that brotherhood element, especially now that we are coming out of over a year of COVID-19 and where the restrictions are lifting, the pandemic, God willing, it looks like it's coming to an end. Trying to get back into the mentality that we were in and, and starting to think about with, in terms of brotherhood pre-COVID how do we reactivate our, our thought process along those lines? Because we've been disrupted so much in the past year plus. And the other word that you used that I thought was important was work. Because during the pandemic, we've been isolated. 
from each other, from the churches. There were a period of time we couldn't even go to church. And honestly, I think a lot of us coped differently uh, while we were locked up and cooped up at home or under lockdown. The importance of work and what does work look like now coming out of the pandemic? Does it differ at all or, or will it take more effort to get into that same mentality than it did a year and a half ago? Well, I'll address the, the work thing first, okay? Work is not just your vocational work. Work is anything creative, right? So, so the best way to get yourself moving in the right direction is do some kind of creative work. So if I'm slumping, if I'm slumping, one of the first things I do, and I want to get myself out of the slump, one of the first things I do, I'll, I'll like clean my office. It really doesn't matter what the work is. Bring structure back into your life. I'll clean my car. I'll do something, right? That's mindless stuff, but it's still creative and it's still productive. It produces something. It creates increase, right? And so, um, and then some of us, you know, we have jobs, you know, so, you know all of us have jobs and some of it, some parts of our jobs are not very fulfilling, but we have to do them, right? And so, but if we have self-discipline, we do do that. But if we have another outlet, another outlet, um, you know, what happens is the creativity starts flowing into its proper channels. I'll give you an example of my life. I mean, I was just getting kind of like worked out. I was very busy. And I was getting worked out and I was doing the work and I was doing it well, but I was getting worked out. So I thought I need something creative to do. So this sounds a little weird, but I did, I made my own mouse pad. I wanted a bigger mouse pad. So I made my own mouse pad and it's got a leather cover, right? But it felt really good to do that. And it gets me back on track. All right. So in that sense, work is to create in, increase because we're creators. We're creators. So, so we, 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 you know, God is creator. We're created in the image and likeness of God. He creates the creation. We refashion the creation. And, and, and that's what I mean by work. Now, the brotherhood thing I've been thinking about a lot. Okay. And I'm thinking maybe I need to talk about the brotherhood thing the same way I talk about the porn and self abuse problem, which is just, you know, plain in your face. Because when you talk about it that way, everybody's kind of relieved you're saying it because everybody knows it's a problem. But everybody dances around it and everybody's too, too, too afraid to bring it up. So I, I've discovered that in just bringing it up and dealing, dealing with it plainly, a lot of good comes out of that and a lot of creativity is unleashed in the world. So let's talk about brotherhood. The reality is, is men need men. It's very, us, it's very hard for us to talk about it in those terms because, because the, the, the culture has become so homosexualized, it almost sounds homosexual to say that. We're reluctant to say that. But men need the love of other men. It's the strongest bond that there is. And, and we men crave communion with other men. We're looking for deep, deep friendship because the deep friendship, the love of another man nourishes us and our love for another man nourishes him. We need this and we don't have it. And so when we're talking about, about brotherhood, we're really talking about the intimacy between men. It's very hard to talk about this nowadays because that dimension of human experience has been co-opted by the gay lobby. It has. And so it's, it's, men are reluctant, men are reluctant to talk about that because it sounds gay. And we're uncomfortable with it. But the reality is most of us are very lonely. I see that, I learned this talking to the young men. They're just, they're, they're so lonely. And so are most of the men in our culture. We're very lonely. So the brotherhood, now we don't sit around and talk about feelings, but you know what we do is we build stuff together. That's where that bond is established. 
we work and and amen is a perfect vehicle for that but but if that's if it succeeds you know where you you actually develop a friendship with one or two men good friendships with them then um you know the nourishment to the soul that is needed because god well, created that is is given Does that answer anything, Michael? Yeah, it does. That was great. Uh, we have maybe about five minutes left before we hopefully uh, will be able to take a short break before our meeting. There's a couple other questions in here. Um, I'll just quickly bring one up. Maybe if you could give a brief response to each. Uh, Mark was asking, could athletics such as training for a half or full marathon be used as work and mastering our body? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. It's a goal. It's a goal. Yeah, something to work towards. And I've noticed that when I exercise, I feel that I have more en energy. I know there's something physiologically to that, but keeping our bodies in shape helps, helps to fight, you know, our, I guess, trying to comfort ourselves too much. Uh, that self-mastery, I think athletics has always been a great analogy, Father, and you've talked about that before. There's a really good question from Mark Santana. Yeah. You mentioned father absent homes being a factor. Should this father wound be addressed directly? And if so, how? Yeah, um, yeah, it, it must be directly, but it must be addressed directly, but how it's direct, it's addressed directly by becoming a father to this young man. Yeah. So it's it's addressed in the doing. All right. Almost every guy I talk to has it. Right. And it takes them a it takes them a while to to trust. I mean, I had one guy, beautiful guy. I love this guy. We love each other. Um, I you know, but his 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 upbringing was rough, and I you know, and I noticed he started to trust me, and I thought, why is he trusting me? given you know what is it why is it why is he trusting me and after about a year i asked him i saw his trust grow i said we'll call him george i said george why do you trust me you trust me right he goes yeah he says why do you trust me and this is what he told me and this is what opened my eyes to my earlier point no one desires her healing more than god he said because every time you prayed for me father i felt the presence of god mm. When I did the praying, he felt the presence of God because I brought him through that. I, I brought God to him through my prayer. You, you understand what I'm saying? But if the prayer wouldn't have been prayed, he wouldn't have experienced it. Because he experienced the presence of God when I prayed, then that gave him assurance to trust me. And that's what showed me how merciful and powerful God is in their lives. And that's how you start addressing the father wound. You become a father to them. Yeah. What happens. And how, how are you, how are you, how do you become a father to them? You do what fathers do or what they should be doing is you understand who your son is and you direct him to become in the direction of the person God created him, him to be. I could see just tremendous talent in this guy yeah. when I first encountered him. And you know what? He responded. He's doing very, very well. And that's what you do with every man. And now every man's different, right? Every man has a different trajectory. And but you have to discern that. You have to discern that clearly, and you have to encourage them and direct them, and them help them overcome these vices, in order for them to you know, blossom like a rose. Yeah. And they do. We got a couple more. I was hoping to fit these in. If you can give a brief response. Mark had a question related to what you were just talking about. Any advice on how to approach this subject to our sons and grandsons? Well, um, you, you, you get close to them and they get close to you. Okay. And when when it comes up or they come of age, usually if they trust you, they'll bring it up. Um, they'll have a question for you. You tell them what the truth is. That's how it is. And, and because they trust you and because they know you love them, those words you give them are gonna be very, very powerful for them. And 
hopefully, hopefully steer them away from um, the consumption. I had a kid in my, my church. He never came that much. But one day he was there sitting in the front row and he was, he never did porn when he was growing up. Somehow he avoided it. But I knew he was watching it. He was starting to watch it. And, and um, I just knew it. I just discerned it. I was going to say something to him, but he ran out. Three weeks later, he was there. The summer thought I'm going to tell him. And I did. I went up to him and I said, look, porn is really dangerous. It's addictive. It's going to lead you down a bad path. I know you're, you're watching it. You should knock it off. And he told me three years later, sometimes you get this, right? He told me three years later, I was so angry when you told me that. But the truth was, I had just started looking at it. And because of what you said, I quit, right? And so he's never had a problem with it. He's one of the few who's never had a problem with it. And, and sometimes you go on that, you go on your gut. Yeah, Father, the uh, last question, if we can get this one in quickly. Okay. Uh, Theodore had another one. The internet provides another temptation. Prostitutes are widely available and post their pictures and, and contact information. Is, that, is this different than pornography? Yeah, I mean, if you're hiring prostitutes, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that's what's behind the question, right? Um, well, maybe are the same dynamics at play. I mean, obviously, prostitution might be considered an escalation of what we've been talking about. But I guess in my reading of the question, it's if we don't do something to resist that temptation, that I guess um, cascading or snowballing effect going to the next level, is it the same dynamics, just more intensely? Yeah, I mean, if, you know, prostitutes are on the internet, that's just like pornography, right? If you're looking at pictures of prostitutes instead of porn, I mean, what's the difference? There isn't any. But the thing is, is that that if, if this is really active in your life, um, you know, either a person will withdraw into himself completely, he'll lose himself because everything's vicarious. But there's a biological limit to it, right? Or you will act out in one way or another. Yeah. That's what will happen. Father, we're going to wrap things up. I wanted to remind everyone that we're going to build on this discussion and on Father Han's talk this coming Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, I believe that's 1 p.m. Central. I think I got the time right. We have Father Costa Petra George, who's going to be talking uh, really about intimacy, about really taking this conversation and building upon what Father uh, Hans has talked about. So um, if you're not aware of that, please refer to your, your VPLC schedule. I know everyone in this meeting should have registered uh, for the VPLC. So we have a bonus event this coming Saturday with Father Costa Petra George, and we're going to take this up a notch uh, to dive in even deeper. It's a very important topic, and if it doesn't affect you who is listening to this right now, I guarantee you it's affecting somebody you love, a friend, a family member, probably more than one. And there's, I know during the pandemic, it's been very hard on especially men. And I think the sensuality, the sexual temptations have uh, have really been difficult for a lot of our brothers uh, and for ourselves. So these are important topics that it's important that we talk about and to hear from our clergy. Uh, thank you, Father Hans, for your, your bravery, your wisdom, and your just complete matter of fact openness on these subjects, because I think talking about them in plain language is what we all need to hear. Thank you, Michael. I tremble for the fearful day of judgment, but trusting the compassion of thy mercy, I shall to thee like David have mercy. According to thy great mercy.